Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm back with another video on, on uh, it's a tutorial video. Uh, I've been making um, uh, software defined related videos for a while now. So I just want to come back to it and I just want to explain something which is known as an OSI layer and an internet layer. Uh, so basically the first thing that you normally see in OSI layer is actually a seven layer model which comprises of application layer, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical layer. And when you look at your internet layer, it actually comprises of uh, application layer, uh, transport, network, data link, and physical layer. So basically what they have done, all of these three layers that you normally see, which is presentation and session layer, they are all get combined into something called an application layer. So let's just, let, let me just briefly go over this. So what do I mean? So let's go over every single one of them by one by one. So let's say, for example, you're looking at an application layer. So basically application, what it means is actually your browser. So for example, uh, it could be your Chrome. It could be Firefox or it could be Safari, anything that is letting you browse the internet to getting you an access to internet. Presentation layer, the job of a presentation layer is to do perform encryption. So end-to-end -end encryption, handshakes and things like that. Session layer is normally a session. So for example, you're trying to access services, uh, Google services. So session layer, so for example, you type in, go to your Gmail account. Uh, there is a session which is associated with your username and password. Think of it that like a session. So you visit a website, a particular website, that is probably a session. So, so, so that, that is this. So basically an interconnectivity, uh, I just want to call it. All right. Rest is transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and physical layer. So in normal, uh, uh, in generalized term, in internet layer model, we have combined all of these three into an application layer. All right. So we're going to look at some of the protocols that are underlying in terms of application, transport, network, data link, and physical layer, uh, which is valid for both OSI layer model and interla internet layer model as well. So what are some of the applications that we, we use at application layer? So first application that we normally use when we, when we open our browser is HTTP services. So one of the example of the application, application layer service is actually uh, HTTP. I'm just going to draw a line okay, like this. So one of the example is HTTP. So every time you, you do start browsing on internet, this is what HTTP. So we use HTTP. So when we type www.u2.com, so basically you are using HTTP services. All right. Uh, what are some other services that we normally use? One of the older services that we used to use is called FTP, which is also an application layer protocol or application layer service, which is known as file transfer protocol. In older days, or even some website nowadays, where they host some type of a file, which you just simply click and download, uh, this is also a file transfer protocol. Uh, other services that we normally use is uh, your email services. I think it's SMTP, which is simple mail transfer protocol. That is used by Google services, like Google Gmail, Yahoo Mail, and any type of a mail services, the underlying protocol which is being used is SMTP. Some other services that works uh, on the back end of your system, like for example, as soon as you type www.u2.com, one of the services is to transfer, to transform that u2.com into an IP address that is done through domain name service or domain name services or domain name system. This is, this is sort of like an internet directory. So, so every time you type in, once you open up your application, which is your browser, you simply go ahead and type www.youtube.com. That is for humans to understand or just to remember the URL, but computer does not understand that. That is associated with some kind of an IP address. So instead of remembering the IP address, what, let's say, for example, hypothetically speaking, 110.136.12.1, it's hard for humans to remember that. So domain name system is the one that actually transform your IP addresses into something called, uh, 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 
your your name like youtube.com into IP addresses that is done through domain name services or domain name system. The other underlying protocol that works on back end is another protocol which uses uh, which is also an application layer protocol that is known as DHCP dynamic host configuration protocol. So what it does is that every time you uh, you 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 sign up to a new Wi-Fi network or every time you plug in your RJ45 DSCP is the one that gives you an IP address. It automatically assign from a pool of pool of an IP address, it will assign you an IP address before you even go to a browser. So for example, every time you walk into a new Wi-Fi network, so DSCP will get active. So you will just go ahead and sign in, uh, uh, log in using password, and then DSCP runs on the back end and it will assign you an IP address from its pool, dynamically assign an IP address. And there are many more. So these are some of the basic protocols that is actually working on an application layer. Now, here, here at, at this application layer and this application layer, uh, the data, the service, the, the website, or the thing that you want to get access, it's called data or a message. There's a particular name associated with every single layer. So, so when a message gets traveled, so an application layer, your data is actually called message. Now, it gets traveled down to transport layer. So, every layer will include some type of an information about its layer, all right? So, as soon as your message comes down to a transport layer, the two dominant protocol that is being used by transport layer is TCP and UDP. Transmission control protocol, if I'm not mistaken, and UDP user datagram protocol. All right. So where do I use them? TCP is a reliable protocol. All right. It's a reliable protocol, while UDP is not a reliable protocol. So TCP, which means transmission control protocol, UDP means user datagram protocol. TCP is actually being used where you need reliability. So for example, let's say a protocol like SMTP, which is actually a Google Mail or any type of a mail service, that it will ensure that whatever is being transmitted from a transmitting end, the receiver should receive exactly every single thing without any loss in a message. It could be a possibility that during the transmission from these layers and to an, a medium, which it could be a wired or wireless medium, the transmission might get corrupted. So, so every time if there's a loss of a data or a packet or a bit, it will ask the sender to, if, if, if your SMTP is using TCP, it will ensure that if there's some error in the transmission using error correction algorithms, it will ask the sender to either retransmit that data or receiver should have a capability based on those er error correction codes to actually uh, correct that error at the receiving end. So normally in eight, uh, like for example, in wired network, normally this is done through by asking or asking for retransmission of that data. So TCP does that. It actually tells the user to retransmit that data. You know what? The data that you have sent me, it has an error. Why don't you retransmit that data again? So this is normally used. So I know this protocol is a little bulkier because if there is an error in the transmission, it will be keep asking the sender to retransmit re that data. But there are some services which does not require that, which you want to, you, you don't want to put too much burden on transport protocol. Like for example, DNS and DSCP. These are type of the protocols which requires not the retransmission, we can just refresh the page and I'll get that thing again if there is an error in the transmission. So DNS and DSCP uses UDP while HTTP, FTP and SMTP uses TCP. Another service that uses UDP is actually your streaming websites. So for example, um, I'm not going to exactly name the website. Why? Because I'm not sure sometime these websites, streaming web platforms, they use as proprietary softwares. Uh, so normally, for example, when you're streaming a video, let's say you're streaming a game or you're streaming a football game, uh, you just don't care about the retransmission because in a video streaming, if there is an error in the bits, you might get a jitter in your video and that can be fixed. I mean, you get a jitter for like a second and then we can easily tolerate that jitter. 
But when it comes to your email and other services, you cannot tolerate that. So UDP is being used for streaming platforms and things like that. Now, so this will add, so, so you'll have an original message that might look something like this. Now, when it comes to a transport layer, it would become like this with a header to it. It will have a header associated with transport layer. So when the packet now travels from application layer to transport layer, transport layer will include some type of a header to it, which tells me either it's TCP or UDP and all the associated uh, things related to that uh, header, uh, to that layer. Now when the data travels to network layer, one of the dominant protocol at network layer is actually an IP, IP address, all right? So IP address, think of it like this. Uh, IP address is like sort of like your logical address uh, while your MAC address which is actually embedded on your network interface card which is unique every single radiating device will have a unique MAC address but IP address can be changed either you could be in public network or a private network but what IP address allows me to do think of it like this IP address is sort of like your current location or current address while your 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 mac address which is embedded on your on your network interface card is basically your uh, permanent address so ip so the next job the next layer will be an ip address uh, will be a network layer and the dominant protocol here is ip and the job of an ip address allows actually to, the job of an ip address is to perform in in a nutshell routing so let's say, for example, uh, this packet, uh, which is a request that you have sent from your laptop that you want to access www.youtube.com and you want to look at a particular video that goes through transport layer, transport layers, okay, uh, look for, okay, this type of a content, should I do TCP or should I do UDP? Let's say it decided to do TCP. Once it's decided to do TCP, the next thing is network layer. Now, network layer needs to perform routing. Let's say this application, this 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 uh, uh, this request is coming from somewhere uh, from from China, let's say, or or somewhere from other some 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 other country, and it needs to go to YouTube.com, which might be located somewhere in the U.S. So so the network layer will start route uh, making a route like sort of like a map. What is the closest and what is the easiest way and what is the shortest distance I can travel? to get access to this service. So routing is performed by one of the job of network layers to perform routing. It tried to look for the shortest possible path. I made a video on Dijkstra algorithm and how does it look for a shortest path? You can also look at it. I'll put a link in the description. Now this data link layer. So now this will also include its header. So now you had a message. You have HT, which is the header of your transport layer. Now it will have a header of your network layer, HN. That will have all the information in IP address and things like that. Now, data link layer, in my opinion, is, mo is one of the most important layer because it has two jobs. The first job of this layer is to perform error correction and detection. During the transmission, when you're transmitting data, there could be a possibility that your, your, your message gets corrupted because you're using a wire or you, you are sending your signal wirelessly, there is 100% chances that it might get corrupted. So error correction, it allows me, it allows me to actually have a capability to actually, if there is an error in the transmission, to ask the sender to resend that data again. Second, second, using forward error correction method scheme, I should have a capability that I'll be able to correct that data at the receiving end. This is normally done in wireless systems that 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 my 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 system should have capability to, to actually correct that error at the receiving end without asking the sender to retransmit that data. Retransmission normally happens when you have a wired network like Ethernet. All right. So this is error correction and detection. This is done by so two jobs, so error correction and detection. <clears throat> and second job of your Mac, of your data link layer is actually medium access control. All right, I got to explain this. This is amazing. 
The second job of your data link layer is to perform medium access control. Now, what medium access control is, is this. So normally in a lab environment and things like that, you have, you have a, let's say you have 40 PCs and they are connected in the star topology, which means every individual cable, Ethernet cable is coming out from your PC, going into a switch. Now this switch, let's say it's a 24 port switch or a 40 port switch. So individual wires are going into that switch. Now that switch only have one wire that is going to a router and that router is connecting you to internet. Now, how does all of these 40 PCs get access to a single wire that is connecting to a router? All right, so basically you have to contend for a medium. All right, I hope you're getting it. What I'm saying is this, you have 40 PCs which are individually, which has a RJ45 coming out that is going terminated at a switch. Now switch does not have 40 parallel lines that are going into the router. There is only a single piece of wire that is con connecting that switch to a router and the router allowing you to connect to internet. So how does it take place? So basically every, so the job of a medium access control is to use different techniques to get access to a single medium and, and provide access to 40, 50, 60 uh, uh, computers. Example being like this, uh, think of it like a classroom. Let's say you have 100 students in your class and you are a single teacher. So how do those 100 students will get access to you? Definitely, definitely there has to be some type of a protocol. And that protocol in RJ40, in 802.3, in, in, in 802 which is Ethernet, is CSMA, carrier sense multiple access. In wireless, in wireless environment like in, in mobile telephony, we have FDMA, TDMA, CDMA, OFDMA and things like that. But in, in wired, the dominant protocol is actually CSMA, carrier sense multiple access. Before, just like in a classroom, if 100 students are there and they want to get access to their professor, what do they do? They probably have some type of protocol of raising their hands and waiting for other student. If some other student is talking to a professor, he should remain quiet and wait for him to finish. And then he start speaking to the professor. Exactly the same thing, pro same protocol is being implemented in data link layer, which we are calling it CSMA. This is how normally it works. So two jobs of data link layer, medium access control and error correction. And the next, uh, Next layer is nothing but, of course, it will also include its header. So your header might be something like, now you have HN, you have HT, this is your message. Now you have a header which is associated with data link layer, or let's call it HD. And now everything that you've been working on, now this will get converted in a form of a bits or, or using some other type of device, all the cabling, all your wire system, or your amplification, all the modulation, everything goes here at physical layer. So this is in a nutshell, this is how an application OSI layer, which is similar exactly. The, these three are combined together to call an application layer, but exactly same thing, same, same things take place on this side as well. So let's just quickly look at, so we have data, we call it message as application layer, at transport layer, we call it segments. You guys gotta remember this. That's why you, when, you, when you're looking at your reliable transfer protocol, it has segments. And at network layer, they are called packets. At data link layer, they are called frames. And at physical layer, they are just called bits. So these are names. Uh, what do you call your data at every single layer? So at application layer or an application presentation and session layer, we call them just a message. At transport layer, we call it a segment. At, at network layer, we call it packets. At data link layer, we call it frames. And at physical layer, there are just nothing but bits. If we are just simply transmitting it on my uh, wired network, if I'm transmitting on my uh, wireless system, of course, those bits need to be transferred into electromagnetic waves and things like that. So I hope you understand this. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, leave it in a comment section. And uh, if you have any questions, do please leave it in a comment section. Uh, I hope you like this small tutorial on OSI layer versus internet layer. If you have any questions, leave it in the comment section. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel.